Hello, you're watching Hornbill TV and in today's special show, we have with us an esteemed guest who is also the British Deputy High Commissioner to Kolkata, Sir Nick Lowe. And in today's special show, we will try and speak more on India's relation with the UK and also UK relation with the Northeast in particular and the various aspects that make this relation a one of a kind. So first of all, thank you so much, uh, Sir Nick, for joining us on Hornbill TV. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, it's a huge pleasure to be with you in Dimapur and indeed in uh, in Nagaland. Uh, thank you, sir. All right, sir. First of all, as the Deputy High Commissioner in Kolkata, you're you're the UK representatives in 13 states and one union territory. Yeah. So, sir, would this be your first visit to Nagaland, especially Dimapur, Kohima? It it is sadly. Um, I don't know what my horoscope said the day I got off the plane <laughs> when I arrived in October 2019. Uh, it certainly uh, didn't prepare me for the pandemic. And uh, obviously the 2020-2021 mm. were particularly difficult years yes. for all of us. It wasn't mm. possible to travel as we would like to yes. have done. Uh, things mercifully are now a lot better. Um, and it, it, it's great to be here. What I hadn't anticipated, funnily enough, having largely had to work from my home or from the office in Kolkata uh, for those first two and a half years of us here, what I'd not anticipated was how much pent-up demand there would be in Kolkata and West Bengal itself. Uh, so when life did return to normal in April, May this year, I found I was inundated with in invitations to conferences, workshops, seminars, people wanting to meet me, people wanting to come into the mission, people wanting me to visit them. So really, it's only the last couple of months I've been able to get out and about as I, I wanted to. Uh, I was in Tripura last week, absolutely thrilled to bits to be in uh, Nagaland this week. And this is a week, you can see I'm wearing the red poppy, uh, this is a week I'd earmark for a trip here to Nagaland because on Friday, which is the 11th of November, Remembrance Day, I want to go and lay a wreath in the war cemetery in memory of all those who laid down their lives in the service of freedom. All right, so uh, you just spoke about how your horoscope did you wrong, but uh, you landed in Kolkata on October 2019, after which the real force of the pandemic was witnessed, mm. especially in mm. India, with mm. lockdowns mm. happening all. Mm. So, uh, what kind of an experience did you have? And also, uh, what kind of, uh, was the pandemic a learning process? Or did it also hamper with some of the visions that you had joining as the Deputy High Commissioner? Well, I, th I, th I think in life as a whole, uh, it's always good to look for the opportunity that comes with challenge or adversity. And it did bring a lot of opportunities. Uh, no one would have wanted the pandemic. I certainly wouldn't have. And I count myself incredibly blessed that my family uh, largely emerged unscathed from the pandemic. Unfortunately, my 14-year-old daughter did get stranded in the United Kingdom for five months, unable to join us when the Honorable Prime Minister uh, closed Indi India's borders. But compared to so many people I know who had loved ones taken from them before their time, I count myself exceedingly lucky. Uh, an experience like no other. I, I suspect that when my children grow old and their grandchildren will say, you know, did you really live through the pandemic? Tell us what it was like. Were you really lo locked down? Um, it was certainly something I never thought I would live to see. What did we do? Uh, I suppose it taught me new skills. Um, I'm, I'm not the most natural convert to new technology, but I've become very proficient on Zoom and Google Meet and uh, Teams and all those other technologies. And I think that's excellent because it will enable us to cut down our carbon footprint. I do now do meetings uh, on live video link that in the past would have seen me jumping on a plane. Uh, probably the, uh, the, the airlines don't like that. They prefer me to jump on a plane and spend money, but hey, it's le less carbon, so it, it's, it's, it's what we do. Uh, it enabled me to do some 
domestic housekeeping that we really needed to do. I, I think very often uh, you can overlook physical infrastructure. And when I arrived in Kolkata, uh, I think our office really did need a bit of tender, lo lo loving care. It was looking its age and a lot of things needed replacing. And it gave us an opportunity to do that. The same with the house in which I live. I think both now really good advertisement for uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and we, we changed a lot of our, our, our systems. And we also learned to do a, a lot of stuff online that we hadn't really been proficient at doing in, in the past. Uh, and I'd also call out the fact that we evacuated many, many British nationals who found themselves stranded in East and Northeast India. Uh, it wasn't easy to do at a time when India was in lockdown and very often traveling from one state to another what wasn't easy. And this is why, you know, as diplomats, we do make a lot of contact so that when we need help with doing something, we know the right people to pick up the phone to. And we got magnificent cooperation from state governments, from state police forces, from city police forces, from all sorts of uh, agencies across India in, in getting Brits who hadn't expected to be locked down in India when they came here back home. And indeed, a lot of Indian people who've got families and jobs in the UK who wanted to get back to their families and jobs. And uh, you know, it was a really big issue for them too. And uh, I've been in the Foreign Office almost 30 years now. I, I have never had so many really touching, heartfelt messages of thanks than I, 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 I got from those individuals or from their family members who were so pleased to see them back home. And uh, that is work that's continued um, with visas. Uh, yes, the V word, which has been, uh, has been very close to my heart over the last... Uh, uh, over, over the last couple of years, I mean, you know, you you could imagine what what happened during lockdown, during the pandemic. For reasons I entirely un, un, understand, people were allowing their British visas to expire. Why why wouldn't you? You know, you, you people felt well, you know, we're locked down. I can't travel to the UK. Why am I going to try and extend my visa? And then we had the period where. India went onto the United Kingdom's red list. Uh, it affected me too when I went back for my holiday uh, at the end of July last year. I had to spend 10 days in a, in a quarantine hotel. When that was lifted, my understanding is my colleagues in the Home Office on the very first day received two months worth of work on one day <laughs> and another two months of work on the day after. And you can imagine there's an immense backlog of um, visa a a applications. And, um, you know, processing visas is skilled work. It's not something you can do with, without a good deal of training. You need to know the, uh, the, the immigration law. And although my colleagues from the Home Office moved as quickly as they could to recruit a extra people, it's taken a while to get through the backlog. We're now almost back to normal. I'm really pleased to say that because any of you viewers there have been affected by this, believe you me, I can understand how frustrating it's been. But we're now very close to being back where we want to be, which is where we process all of our visa applications within 15 working days. 15 working days, three weeks. We're, we're, we're almost there. And I, I certainly think by the end of the year, very early in the new year, that is where we will be. And uh, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't wait for it. All right, sir. So uh, now I'm going to take you back a little, back to memory lane. All right. Uh, UK has been witnessing quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of incidents happening in the UK. What I want to talk about one aspect is the ascension of King Charles now. I mean, as a, kid growing up in the United Kingdom, uh, it was always Her Majesty. So uh, what are some of the changes do you, which are going to take place? I mean, Queen Elizabeth was 
the longest serving monarch yeah. and now with king charles yeah. ascension uh, so is there going to be any mi minor changes to the basic etiquettes the social norms in day to day lives of maybe your g grandchildren or your great grandchildren well it's it's a really good question and i i i still regularly have to uh uh correct myself uh, but you know ultimately i had a new boss um you know i i work for hm diplomatic service but it was no longer her majesty's diplomatic service had become his majesty diplomatic service and there are still times when i go to say her majesty and then i have to I have to correct myself because you know it's been been all my life and i think it's one of the reasons why um you, you know the, the the loss of her majesty um genuinely and dearly loved across the country by people of all ages and, and from all backgrounds she was a constant she'd always been there for us unchanging prime ministers come and go england football team managers come, come and go <laughs> a lot <Yes. laughs> um, you know um rock bands come and go um her majesty didn't all always there for us there's a force for good a force for stability and um you know an, an enormous challenge for his majesty uh to follow the hardest of hard acts to follow but uh, i i know i can genuinely speak on behalf of all my countrymen and countrywomen in wishing him very well in, in, in indeed and i think the you, you know the 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 initial signs to very early days an immensely impressive and sure-footed st start and and real affection towards his majesty from ordinary people when when you see him out, out and about talking to people speaking to people people in, in, in crowds so as with so many of the things that make britain great i i think the throne is in the safest of safe hands and people like me will just have to get used and we'll we'll do it quickly um to saying his majesty rather than her majesty and and getting used to coins with king charles's head on uh postage stamps with king charles's head on and in due course post boxes with C3R and not E2R on them. Oh, all right, sir. Thank you so much for explaining upon that part. All right, now, sir. Now moving on a little bit to the India-UK relations. Mm. So, in the March of 2021, it was estimated that about one lakh students, especially uh, speaking about the education sector in particular, and then in the month of April this year, the India and UK signed an MOU where they accepted the MQR or rather the mutual recognition of academic qualifications. Yep. So which it seems according to experts say this is going to boost. So do you think that this the MQR and the MOU that was signed between the UK and India, do you think that is really going to boost uh, the effectiveness of all the student exchange programs that are presently available between the UK and India? I, I look I the the relationship between india and the uk across the board is amazing it's underpinned by what the honorable prime minister yes. called the human bridge you know at the end of the day we have 1.6 well when the when our last cens census uh was now we have 1.6 million people in the united kingdom of, of indian origin uh we did conduct a new census last year the final figures that aren't yet out. I, I think it will be more than that. I think we, we're going to have more than 1.6 million. Um, but you're absolutely right to call it education as, as being a shining example of uh, the strength of, of that relationship. Uh, at the end of March this year, our figures showed we'd issued 1.08 lakh, 108,000 tier four student visas to Indian students, uh, you know, a doubling of the number in the, the past two years. Why? Well, for very good reason that uh, Britain has got some of the world's best universities, uh, one of the best two universities, two of the best four universities, four of the best eight universities, 
and five of the best 15 universities and lots of other universities in, in the world top 100. Uh, Price-wise, it's very competitive, particularly compared to the United States. And our experience is that Indian students going to study British universities have a very good experience. I mean, clearly, you, you pay your money and you go to university in the UK for the education, but it's only part of the experience. And we see lots of Indian students coming back saying, best three years of my life. Absolutely loved every moment of it. Our universities take very good care of all their students and are very well aware that you know, it's a big, big deal if you're 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old, coming to live in a foreign country on your own for the first time. So there's a, there's a lot of wraparound welfare support for them. And people very quickly make friends. But, you know, as, as an Indian in the UK, you are never alone. Not only will, will you find <laughs> British people very friendly, but you're going to find a lot of people who look like you. So wh wh whether it's buying the ingredients for it to make yourself an, a nice curry uh, in, in your local supermarket, whether it's buying a takeaway meal, whether it's going and watching an Indian movie or listening to some Indian music, hey, it, it, it's, it's there for you. You're going to see a lot that you recognize. All right. I mean, so now that we are speaking on the part of education, I mm. mean, like, there are already various amount of student exchange programs. There are various amount of scholarships. Now, one of the scholarships that, like, uh, which is one of the most prestigious scholarships mm. offered by the UK is the Shivning uh, Scholarship. So rather than talking about uh, what are the ways to get into that scholarship. So do you believe or do you feel that even now, as you just mentioned, that UK has one of the best universities. Mm. So now even the selection process amongst these universities, when it is so competitive enough, so do you think that the categories are slowly changing? Has it now become a little more skill and uh, practical knowledge oriented over then knowledge based you know, education? So do you think that it's slowly the gradient is shifting towards more of experience and hands-on uh, experience at the job? It's a good question. Um, I, I think certainly if you're applying for a first degree, a, a, a bachelor's degree, it really is all, all about why you want to study the subject you want to study at the university you're applying for and you passed ac academic record. I, I think once you move on to master's level, and uh, this is where, where we now come to the Chevening Scholarships. For those of you who don't know, uh, Chevening is the British government's flagship scholarship program. Uh, we awarded 75 this year. Why this year? Because it's the 75th anniversary of India's independence. So we, we wanted to uh, we wanted to replicate that in the number of. Um, scholarships we're offering. Chevening, an odd name, but probably doesn't mean much to many of your viewers. Uh, it's actually the name of the country house that's occupied by the Foreign Secretary. Foreign Secretary is, is what we would call the India's Minister of External Affairs. And because it's a, a foreign office program, that's the name we give it. Uh, it is a one year fully funded master's program. And what I like about Chevening is it's any university and any subject. So we don't insist that all our evening people, you know, go off and do astrophysics at Oxford. Uh, if you want to read uh, sports psychology or golf course design, which you can do at British u universities, and can convince us you want to be a leader in your field, there's absolutely no reason why you can't be successful as a Chevening Scholar. The key thing about Chevening Scholars, I mean, you, we have to say, you, you, have to, you have to be reasonably bright to get one, but the key factor we look for is leadership. People who want to be leaders in their fields. People who've, who've got that spark and say, you know what, I want to go right to the top in my field. I feel I can, if not change the world, I can change India. I can change Nagaland, I can make a real difference here in Dimapur. Um, and it can be in any field. I'd be absolutely brilliant if someone who I interview says, I want Narendra Modi's job in 10 years' time. Fantastic. 
but we will accept people wanting to be leaders in, in other fields. And we have got thousands of chiefening scholars all around the world. Yes, some of them presidents, some of them prime ministers, many of them are ministers in their governments. But we've also got people who are chief executives of big businesses. We, we've got people who've become university professors, people who are leaders in, in the media, either in front of camera like you or behind the scenes, people who are in leadership positions in the arts, so in, in music, in painting, uh, people who, whatever their field, are making a big difference. So to and anyone listening, and don't worry if you can't spell Chevening, if, if you go to your favourite search engine and look up British government scholarships, all the information is there. There's a lot of information there. And it will guide you both on what we're looking for, but also on how to submit a successful uh, application. And um, I don't think there's anything that's given me more pleasure in the three years I've been here than to see the huge increase in the number of successful candidates from this part of India. Um, my first year here, I took, a I took a look at the list and there was Kolkata. And by Kolkata, I don't mean the city of Kolkata, I mean my consular area. So this is the 13 states of East and Northeast India. There we were, bottom but one in the league table. <laughs> Wasn't happy with that, wasn't happy with that at all. Last two years, we've been second in the league table. Only Delhi has had more successful candidates than we have. And, and Delhi has, has got a huge consular area, including its Pradesh. I mean, it's 200 million people before you, you, you even start. Um, and, and what has been brilliant is to see the number of those successful applications coming from what I'd call non-traditional areas. So we, we, we've had lots of successful applicants from Bihar, from Chhattisgarh, from Jharkhand, from Odisha. We've, we've had people from Sikkim, from Assam, from Meghalaya, from Tripura. Brilliant. Come, come on, Nagaland, we, we want you. We want you. So, Eddie, Eddie uh, we want people from across the Northeast, obviously. But I say this because I'm in Nagaland and I can't remember yet having interviewed a candidate from Nagaland so please do take a few minutes out look it up see if you think it, it, it it's going to be for you what we find is we can do lots of online publicity and, and we do but you know if you don't follow me or you don't follow the British Deputy High Commission in Kolkata on on social media the chances are you're not going to hear about it we wondered why is it suddenly we're getting all these applications from Chhattisgarh and Bihar that we've never had in the past and the reason is because we've had students from those states go to the UK as chiefening scholars they've loved it they've broadcast it on social media to their families to their friends to their social circles and those people are thinking you know what I fancy a bit of that I'm going to apply for that. And it's classic word of mouth. You know, people like your TV station, they go into the office and say, you want to start watching Hornbill TV? It's really good. And it is good. It really is good. It's good. You know that because you're watching it. Uh, uh, that they, that they publicise the fact they've got a Chevening Scholarship and say, look, if I can do it, you can do it. Why don't you, you apply? But the fact that at, at the moment we, we haven't got anyone from Nagaland, we've no one from Nagaland is really putting that out on their social circles. And that's, that's what we need. All right, so now uh, moving on to a, a topic which is quite dear to you, uh, and that is the topic on environment. And yeah. so, so, Egypt is currently hosting the COP27, and in just recently, uh, UN Chief Guterres just mentioned that we, and I quote, we are on a highway to climate hell with our pedal on the accelerate. Yeah. So, sir, uh, in this regard, and also with the UK having the legacy of inking the COP26 in Glasgow, I mean, so how dire is the need to actually conserve the environment at this particular period of time? And also, 
what could be some of the contributions towards this sector through the India-UK ties? Really good question. Uh, we have no higher foreign policy priority than climate. And I say that well aware of what's going on in Ukraine at the moment. You know, climate is existential. This is a war we can't afford to lose. I'm encouraged by the fact there are fewer and fewer people out there who deny that there is a crisis. The evidence, absolutely overwhelming. Um, we all, we, we've spoken for years about a, you know, a tipping point, a point where suddenly the planet would say no more and things would start to change and change very rapidly. And I really wonder if 2022 is the year we're going to look back on as the tipping point. You know, in, in Pakistan, we, we have seen, and I, and I will say this from a, using a Christian phrase, you know, floods of biblical proportions, the like of which never seen before. An area of Pakistan flooded, and not just ankle deep water, but water up to here, the size of the entire United Kingdom. The United States having its worst drought for a thousand years, Europe having its worst drought for 500 years, the Yangtze River, the lifeblood of China, drying up completely in, in, in places. We saw the floods in Assam earlier in this, uh, earlier this year. We, we've seen ferocious hurricanes barreling through the Caribbean recently. That is not normal. And it's part of a pattern. The UN themselves have just said the eight warmest years in recorded history have been the last eight years. We've got the warmest surface temperatures in, in the great oceans of the world, the tropical Atlantic, tropical Pacific, tropical Indian Ocean that we've ever had. Those are the things that really drive our, our weather. This is now up close and personal. It's knocking on your door, it, it's knocking on my door, and we need to do something about it. I think we can do something about it. I think we are doing something about it. Um, Glasgow was a big moment. The Glasgow Climate Pact that all the countries agreed at, at the end of last year's COP26. And what an amazing achievement that was. You know, 190 odd countries in a very fractured and fractious world all coming together yeah. to agree this. And that climate class, that Glasgow Climate Pact keeps the hope of containing climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial revolution levels alive. It's going to be difficult. No one's saying it's not going to be difficult, but it is doable. Um, I, I come from a country that I grew up, and I was not very happy with the uh, uh, with, with hearing this. I grew up in, in a country that had the nickname of being the dirty man of Europe. Why? Well, because we were full of factory chimneys belching out black smoke, which went up into the atmosphere and got carried across to our friends in Scandinavia and fell as acid rain over Norway and Sweden and killed a lot of the trees in, in their forests. Uh, we did not have a good news to tell on climate at that point. Since 1990, we've reduced our carbon emissions by 43% and grown our economy by 75%. We've got a lot more still to do. We want to be carbon neutral. We want everyone to be carbon neutral. In our case, we want to be carbon neutral by the year 2050. And we've got some legislative. You know, I think you know you really do need to put this stuff into law or it risks not happening. So all cars in the government fleet in my country will be electric by 2027. By 2035, you will no longer be able to buy a car that is not electric. They just won't be for sale. Um, we're, we're seeing a vast expansion of wind energy. Uh, we will uh, soon have the world's largest offshore wind park. Already, there, there have been days last year and this year, where we have managed to generate over 60% of all our electricity needs through wind energy. 
So th that would have been unthinkable just, t just 10 years ago. So this can happen. Um, we are working with India as we are in so many areas. Uh, at central government level, uh, the Honourable Prime Minister's initiatives, the International Solar Alliance, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Technology, the United Kingdom, an, an enthusiastic member and supporter of both of, of those, uh, at the local level too, and it's really important what we do at the local level because central governments can't do this all on, on their own. You know, we, we need companies to join us, business, industry. We need the support of universities and academia. We need the support of civil society. We need the support of everyone, me and you watching. Each of us in our own way can be our own climate leader in, in the way we live our lives. Choosing sustainable options where, where they're available and not wasting energy. Uh, I've seen some marvellous examples of that uh, across India. Um, where, where I live in, in Kolkata, which is doing an amazing job on electric mobility, uh, won a very prestigious C40 prize at the uh, Mayor's Conference in Copenhagen a couple of years ago. Uh, we're working very hard there to share lessons learned and expertise on electric mo mobility. Uh, we're doing the same in other states uh, across I India. You know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we already know. There's a lot of uh, solutions that are fairly readily available. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we don't yet know on, on climate and where we will need to uh, d develop uh, solutions. But I, I'd say to an, anyone watching this, this is still a war we can win. It, it's a war we must win. Uh, and it's a war that we can win. And it's something in which each and every one of us has a role to play. So I, I, I'm hoping some good things will uh, come out of Conference of Parties 27, COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh. And I'm delighted to say that next week on uh, COP27 Solutions Day, we, we, we've got a couple of uh, companies headquartered in Kolkata will be coming into uh, our office to sign the ZEV declaration, the Zero Emission Vehicle Declaration. <coughs> committing themselves to electrifying the, their vehicle fleet. That's brilliant news. All right. Now, sir, I mean, like, in this regard, uh, since this is your meet, uh, your first trip to head, uh, Dimapur, you'll be heading up to Kohima. Uh, we've also come to know that uh, on your visit this time, you'll also be m meeting with the award recipient, uh, Dr. Nuklu Pom, uh, who is also a famous envi Naga yep. environmentalist. Yep. So, sir, what would... If you could kindly please share with us what could be some of the topics that you would like to speak to uh, Mr. Nuklu Pom about. And also, sir, uh, when it comes to protecting the environment and conserving mm, mm, our own habitat. Mm, mm. So, would you agree when people say that indigenous people are far off better than conserving their indigenous habitat? Uh, that that's a, a very good point that, that you, you you make at the end. There, I mean, look. Firstly, when I'm, I meet Mr. Bum, uh, it's always about doing things with people and not doing things to people. So I, 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 I want to learn from him. I'm certainly not going to presume to say you, you you need to do this, that, and the other. I'm going to listen. I'm I'm going to learn, and particularly get get a sense of how we, we can work with the authorities here in Nagaland and ac across the Northeast to really boost um, adaptation, resilience, and all the other projects. In terms of working with um, traditional communities, I ab absolutely agree. I was with some, uh, some great guys from University of Newcastle last night. Uh, University of Newcastle, one of our top universities in, in the UK. They're doing a multi-year project down in the uh, Shundabans, both sides of the border, India and Bangladesh. 
And one of the things that they are looking at is what we can learn from local people in, in respect of resilience and a adaptation. It's absolutely crucial that that learning is, is recorded and, and is shared. And one of the interesting things about that particular project is they're doing the same thing in two river deltas in Vietnam, the Red River Delta, the Mekong R River Delta, again with, with local people there. And we'll be, if you like, cross-pollinating. We'll be sharing that, that learning amongst the people in the three deltas. But also we're going to take it out to the world at, at large because it, it really is Im important. And, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about indigenous communities that have lived in peace and harmony with their in environments since time Im immemorial and have established a settlement that suits everyone, that, that, that it is sustainable, but it enables them to live good lives. Um, I, I think the climate and the environment is, is a hand in, in a glove. You really can't have one without the other. You know, we, we know that trees and particularly the rainforests play a vital part in controlling the amount of carbon in, in, in the atmosphere. Um, we know that the environment is acutely threatened by climate change. Um, you know, people someone say to me, why, Nick, why, so okay, well, so what's the big deal about 1.5? It doesn't really matter if it's two degrees warming, does it? You know, and it, yeah, I, I get that. You know, I could go outside with one of your viewers and we could say, what do you reckon, is it 26 or is it 26.5 degrees? And we wouldn't know, they feel the same. You know, what's half a degree between friends? But actually, in terms of climate change, it makes an immense difference. At 1.5 degrees warming, I, I think it's 700 million people will live in acute climate stress. Push it up to two degrees, that becomes two billion people. You know, the, the difference is frightening. At two degrees, we're probably going to lose all the coral reefs on the, on the planet. They'll, they'll all die out because water will, will be so warm. None of us want that. I, you know, I don't want that. I'm sure none of you listening want that. We don't want that for our children or our children's children. This is why it's so important that we look after the environment because it's very difficult to have a degraded env environment and be serious about fighting climate change and of course that also crosses over into zoonotic pathogens um, you know we we don't 100% know and possibly we never will 100% know but I, I think the vast majority of scientific opinion now is that COVID-19 was a zoonotic disease. In other words, it jumped from one species to another and, and, and to humans. And the, the more we violate our relationship with, with nature, um, which you know, in, increasingly we are doing, uh, sadly, we may see more pathogens, perhaps ones that are, are, are even worse. So both because it's the right thing to do, and it is the right thing to do, but also in our own self-interest, we absolutely have to look after our in environment. And I did uh, a wonderful session on the um, eve of uh, Sri Guru Nanak Dev Ji's 553rd birthday uh, with faith leaders from across different religions in, in, in Calcutta and they, they asked me to say a few words and um, I I said you know cl climate change is, is a lot of different issues it's a it's a political issue it's a scientific issue but it is nothing if it's not a moral issue it really is a moral issue and faith leaders by definition give moral guidance to their followers 
84% of people on planet Earth say they follow a faith or a religion. What an astonishing opportunity that is. Could you imagine a politician saying 84% of people support me? It's never going to happen, is it? Never going to happen. 84% of people on planet Earth follow a religion, profess belief in a religion or a faith. If we can harness those people as champions to protect our precious Earth, and all the great religions say that our, our Earth is the creation of the Almighty, whatever one, one calls what one, one's God, it is the creation of an Almighty. And we simply inherit it briefly before we pass it down to our children and our children's children. We have a moral and religious duty to look after our precious Earth. All right, so now on a more optimistic topic, I mean, let's talk about tourism. Tourism has always been a sector where mm. India and UK has always had a blooming and budding relation. But now looking forward to also protecting the environment and also keeping the trend of tourism alive, there's a new context of something called ecotourism. So in this aspect, I mean, like if you look since yeah. you are uh, yeah. the representative of UK of, among all the eight sisters of the Northeast, so, so would you believe that ecotourism could be the next, the big factor when, with regards to the Northeast when it comes for ecotourism between India and UK? Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I think it can be. And I've, I've sort of stuck my toes in, in the water with that today, going to, and I know I'm going to murder the name of the place, <laughs> uh, the Acefa Craft Village, which was, Acefa. yeah. Uh, marvelous! You know, any, anyone who's not been there, please, please go. It's absolutely, it's absolutely tremendous. And uh, I was able to take a look at the uh, Kanchari ruins as, as well on on the, on the way back. And uh, I'll be very interested to uh, um, uh, to see what there is in, in and around Kima. I mean, the, not northeast India for me is an absolute treasure trove of unimagined and unimaginable wonders and beauties it, it really is the tourist potential here is absolutely amazing uh, it's never going to be Disneyland and it's never going to be Dubai and personally I, I wouldn't want it to be it would it would completely change the character the joy the beauty the wonder of Northeast India is its pristine in environment um, I'm delighted to say that having recently been up to Siliguri, uh, which, okay, I know this is West Bengal, it's not the northeast. Having recently been up there and spoken to the government there about their plans for sustainable, clean, green tourism, so much of that rings bells with what we're doing in, in parts of the UK. Uh, the Lake District in, in the northwest of England uh, is synonymous with beautiful clean green rolling hills pure waters la lakes rivers forests and at, at the end of the meeting with the uh, the colleagues in in Siliguri, I said yeah, i'd really like to put you together with those championing sustainable tourism in in the lake district for you to have a chat and learn from one another you know, what, 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 what are you doing that's new and is working and producing benefits? Uh, what have you tried to do and maybe that that's not worked? Because that can be very useful too, uh, to stop other people heading off down paths that ultimately won't, won't come to fruition. So I'm delighted to say that is, is, is going ahead. Uh, you know, absolutely enormous uh, potential here. And that, that, that's good for everyone. Um, Tourism is a very quick multiplier in, in terms of generating jobs. And it, it can generate jobs uh, for unskilled people and for semi-skilled people. Uh, I, don't, I don't really worry about merchant bankers and architects who might lose their jobs. They look after themselves. They go and find another job pr 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 pretty quickly. You know, what, what we want, and maybe... 
you know, y young, young people for whom school has, hasn't gone quite the way they would have wanted to do and are leaving school without too many formal qualifications. Or mid-career or late-career people who, through no fault of their own, have lost their jobs, want to continue working, and that, you know, it offers an immense op opportunity. Uh, it's an important industry for us, actually, in the UK. Not a lot of people know this. But we reckon that in uh, two or three years' time, tourism will account for something like 10% of the British economy. And it's an enormous generator uh, of jobs and e economic activity. So we love Indian tourists coming to our country. And uh, we love British tourists coming, <laughs> coming to India. And uh, I, I, I think we're going to see those numbers really zooming ahead now that international travel has become so much easier. All right, we come to the end of this special episode and that was Mr. Uh, Nick Lowe, who is also the Deputy High Commissioner and <laughs> representative again. of thank the you. UK. And thank you so much, sir, for sharing your thoughts on the various aspects that we spoke about and also your unending effort in the war against climate change. Well, that was all for this, our special episode on Hornbill TV. For more episodes like this, stay tuned to Hornbill TV.